It's interesting. The, the hall actually is kind of more packed than it was when we were packing them out. Um, and that's because this evening, Greg Lynn has come to speak, which we're very grateful. I mean, to describe Greg's as a kind of busy schedule uh, would be a sort of depressive act of uh, underestimation. Um, one of the things one always happens when you know you go away to lecture somewhere is they say, "Oh, last week we had Greg here," and you, you begin to—I mean—you begin to wonder, like, how it's possible. Uh, and that's just the places he teaches it. Um, so anyway, you, you know why you're here. Um, as you know, uh, Greg um, is the principal of uh, the practice form, which was established in 1994. Um, Greg has degrees in philosophy and architecture um, and this, I think, has kind of led to a sort of particular way in which the work is, is kind of nuanced, um, both about the realities of construction and design, uh, but together in his writings, a kind of speculative and theoretical point of view in his writing and teaching. Before establishing his own firm, uh, Greg spent four years working for Peter Eisenman, and he's taught and lectured. Lots of people put this in their CV. They've taught and lectured around the world, which meant they once went to Australia in the mid-70s. Uh, <laughs> in Greg's case, this is an indubitable truth. Um, uh, his architectural designs have received numerous awards and have been exhibited in both architectural and art museums. It's a very great pleasure to welcome Greg Lynn. Well, it's really, it's nice to be back. I have to say, I wish I could have been here the last two weeks, and I haven't had a chance to hear what happened, but I'm very, even though the A is a place that I've done seminars and lectures and been very involved with all the faculty here. It's, it's a place that I've never been totally in the design culture of. And I put together a lecture. I mean, Mark asked me to show mostly focus on work. And I kind of structured things didactically um, and really around the kind of research that, that I do first in my office, I would say. I mean, most um, topics for research emerge out of discoveries in the office or discoveries um, in specific design projects. Then I'll usually take those things that seem the most provocative and also the most expansive in their implications and try to teach them. And I'll teach them for you know several years, usually. And in the process of working those problems out in the academy. I'll also sometimes move out of um, the architectural field and collaborate with uh, artists, sculptors, motion graphics people, more and more different kinds of people, and see what kind of traction these ideas have in other fields. And I have to say, you know, just in thinking about where schools are heading, and I'm sure you're just bored to death hearing about where schools are heading, but I think in very broad strokes, when, when I was working for Peter Eisenman and when I was a graduate student, there was a shift where experimentation in design was really more about looking for theoretical concepts and trying to embody them in some way or trying to um, unfold them in design practice. Over the last five or so years, I think a, a generation that I'm very much a part of and a lot of people at the AA are a part of, who focus more and more on pragmatic issues of intra-architectural problems, of structure, of design, of um, 
different uh, disciplinary issues. And I think the, to the extent that theory participates in those, theory is making sense of and trying to situate those things in a broader field. Now, more and more I've become suspicious of this. I think if you look at the kind of, the reason this happened is because this new medium came on the scene, the computer, everybody's using the computer. Um, I, I think in the last couple of years I realized that, that we spent a lot of time trying to justify the forms we were making with the computer, trying to rationalize them by looking at other fields. Um, I mean, I think still, whenever I'm asked, the kind of greatest conference I can remember was here at the AA with, I think Charles organized it with Brian Goodwin and a whole number of um, kind of natural science, you know, some physicists and people from the biological sciences, where suddenly some of the work we were playing with based on this new medium was having implications for the way they were using the medium in their field and a, a kind of discourse of natural organic form and biological uh, models and justifications as a kind of pseudoscience emerged. Now, that I, I kind of think that there have been schools that have run that um, as a dominant mode. I think that more and more now people are focusing on the discipline at the expense of theory and other connections. So I pulled together some material to let's say show some of the lateral connections with other fields. And I mean it's people like Ross Lovegrove who's here, um, a number of people that I have always admired and looked to and like to collaborate with and exchange ideas with. And I have to say more and more of my practice is very lateral in that sense, that a lot of these things are comparable in other disciplines. I think architecture has a lot to learn from and connect with other fields. Um, and that's, you know, by the way, why I went to the Angevante in Vienna with Wolf and Zaha, mostly because of Wolf and Zaha. But I have to say the school and its multi disciplinary focus where there are you know, two industrial designers, one motion graphics designer, one graphic designer. The fact that there are all these different specialties in the school makes it a very rich place for connections. And I have to say if, you know, if you're looking for outsiders advice on models of directors and models of direction for the school, someone who's very um, connected with other design fields and can make architecture embed in culture, I think it's a smart thing. Mostly because people love architecture. I mean, it's very funny. Uh, I gave a talk at Berkeley a couple years ago and sat down with the students before the talk, which I thought was a great idea, and said, you tell me what you want me to talk about and give me a half an hour, I'll pull the material together. And all they wanted to talk about was tragedy. They were all these, you know, basically somewhere in secondary school, the guidance counselor, finds intelligent, creative people, but with a tendency towards tragedy. And they say, well, you know, the right industry for you is architecture, because it's this kind of Ayn Rand-like field where you can explore your tragedy and creativity at the same time. And I actually don't subscribe to that. I mean, I think architecture has never been more popular. People have never been more interested in it. You know, it's unbelievable how, as an architect, you can get access to basically you know, any fashion designer, or any industrial designer you want, because they all love what's happening in architecture, and they love the publicness of it, and the fact that it's so culturally embedded. And I think it, a lot of times in school, we, for some reason, don't teach the students that it's an exciting field that's culturally embedded. We teach them that it's a place for kind of myopic, tragic geniuses to suffer. So, um, <laughs> I pulled together some stuff that shows some of these interests. I also, to be a little bit autobiographical, um, you know, Southern California is, you know, has been very, very good to me because it has a lot of um, fabrication, pop culture, all kinds of things in a, in a very tight confluence. I, I also think You know, London, because you have aerospace and because you have automobiles and because you have a film industry, unlike many, there aren't that many cities that have those three things. And I actually believe that those, that equation, I mean, art and fashion is also, 
an important thing to have in a city. But I think for architecture to have aerospace, automobiles, and film, it's something architects have been interested in for the last 50 to 70 years. And Southern California, I found, has a great mix of that. Um, what's happening down there, I mean, just as an example, uh, because of, you know, and, and because of all the military right now, it's, it's even more so. But in Southern California, you'll have, um, let's say, a second generation immigrant making, you know, 70,000 pounds a year working in an aerospace factory doing superformed titanium skins. Now, because they're making so much money, they can then take all of that intelligence and technology and they can go in their garage and they can customize 1950s cars and turn them into hot rods using some of that technology from the Boeing aerospace plant. And their next door neighbor is probably building sets for a film studio or something and using similar technologies and also is connected with um, that kind of popular culture, let's say. Um, what that means is that there's a kind of very high technology but also chop shop mentality out there where you get these mixtures and you get these boutique shops and there are shops that do one day um, stuff for offshore drilling, another day something for the aerospace industry and another day something for Hollywood and another day something for the automobile industry like a car prototype. And these aren't inside the design studios they're actually external sources you can go to and use. Now, a lot of these technologies are, you know, they're expensive, um, but the one thing that they all have in common is they're not really mass production facilities. They're places where you make one or two things. So if you want to have a titanium um, water tank in a private jet, and some industrial designer like Ross designs it and sticks the water tank somewhere, and it's a weird shape because it's somewhere between the fuselage and the interior. You have to make a one-of-a-kind titanium part. And so there are these boutique shops which make this kind of stuff, and it gets produced a lot like architecture in the sense that it has mass production and one-off. Okay, so just to show you some of the things that, that I'm interested in in terms of lateral material culture, um, and I'll show this a little more clearly later, but this is a tea set we did for the Alessi Coffee and Tea Towers. And for this we used uh, an aerospace company that does more or less vacuum titanium, where we cut molds out of graphite, um, we put two sheets like a kind of ravioli with an airspace in between them, inside these two blocks of graphite, and we put, they put it in an oven that doesn't have any oxygen in it because it'll build up a crust. And they heat it up and put argon gas to inflate the titanium and then explode a gas in it. It drives the soft titanium into the mold so it picks up. I mean, what's special about it is it's a uniform thickness. You can get all these break forms that you could never get from stamping. But more interestingly, you get integral pattern and texture. So it's almost like casting. It's like a version. It's between stamping and casting, which is why we used it. Um, the titanium material, and then to color it, we build up a, a shell that diffracts light. And it's based on the voltage of the liquid you dip it in. And so we built a little jig. And as we pulled it out of the liquid, the operator just changes the knob from something like 600 volts to 1200 volts and it runs through this kind of green color at the base to this burgundy. Um, and to me the color gradient is important because it makes the forms more voluptuous. You know, the change in color works on a curved surface in a way that it, that it accentuates curvature. So anyway, this, you know, this is an aerospace technology and because of it, the material is very expensive. The tooling, though, is something like uh, 300 pounds or something to make the tools. So we can make multiple tools very cheaply. You know, the tools are, are a fraction of the cost of the titanium material, actually. So it's an example of kind of an industrial process that doesn't rely on high numbers of parts and repetition. Um, this kind of you know, surface research. This is a case we did for Hedy Slimane at um, Christian Dior Homme for Visionaire magazine where 
Hedy Slimane, I have no idea why they put us together, but Hedy Slimane is this hardcore minimalist, and he wanted a case that was as minimal a cube as he could have. And so I thought, well, you know, how am I going to work with him? Uh, but in the end, what I said we would do is eliminate hinges, clasps, brackets, all the hardware that would make the box close. So we could do a perfect, you know, discrete cube with invisible hardware, and that we would use the surface of the interior to, to do all the closure and, and hinging. So there's a magazine that floats in here, and it rides on these little ripples. And then at the edges, these things make these teeth that have a specific shape that corresponds side to side. So it bites together, and when you put it together, unless you lift it up directly perpendicular to the surface, the box stays closed. So the surface integrates the hinges and clasps and all that into its logic. So to give you this kind of discrete box. Um, the same thing for a grill for a lessee, where we take all the handles, the feet, the hinges and closures, and integrate that into the surface. So again, you know, looking at surface geometries that can incorporate all these components um, into a single skin. And it's the top view of that. Uh, in the art world, I, I have to say I don't really do that much. I'm more of kind of a mechanic, you know, like when Inigo Manglano of Valle needs to make a big thundercloud in titanium. He'll call me up and say, where can I mill a 30-foot cubic volume down in Southern California? And I'll tell him. But so because of that quality as a kind of mechanic for the art world, sometimes I do, this was a project we did for a chess set with um, two designers called the, um, the Center for Renewed Fashion Interest, okay, Greg Foley and Don Hearn. And we did it with Jeffrey Deitch. So, and this was manufactured by a company that does car headlights for one-off prototypes. So when you do a concept car, there are certain things like the slump glass of the windshield, which Frank Gehry and Eric Moss use a lot. There are the headlights, which have to be this one-off poured um, uh, latex, there are, you know, the interiors and upholstery, all of that stuff, there's an industry there that supports it. Because in LA there are 18 car studios now, and only one of them actually has this material in-house. So it gets shopped out. But so we use these headlight people, we've used them quite a bit for models also. Um, kind of, you know, more interesting, I've played around a little bit with the film world. This was a redesign for the sci-fi channel that we did with Imaginary Forces, where we had to do seven themes, each one for a, a different evening. And we were producing these kind of atmospheres that were like, um, they have all kinds of names, trailers, bumpers, logos, identities, but all the things that are between the show and the commercials um, that set you up for the themes. But so we did these seven environments for the sci-fi channel. Um, and really kind of looked at them as, as environments in a way. And we've done several collaborations with Imaginary Forces, but now more than half of their work is not working with television and film, it's working with architects doing signage for MoMA, doing moving video walls for Merrill Lynch, all kinds of integrations of moving images and architecture. And they, they work there in United Architects as well you know, kind of equivalent to the architects. This was a project for Microsoft. They have this um, research project called Microsoft Home, where they try to integrate these technologies. And with Rebecca Mendez, uh, we did the, we kind of supported Rebecca in terms of form uh, to do the interface design for the Microsoft Home. So this is like a kind of layers of browsers where you can load your information and basically go from flat grid information to where you store it in these pockets and volumes for all the people that live in the house. So, and we came up with these two kind of different <coughs> organizational systems for them. You know, one set of surfaces, one set is these kind of pockets. And, you know, and we're actually now doing a whole virtual set for a science fiction film and there's a lot of interest. I mean, it, it's amazing when you go 
meet with these people in Hollywood, what incredible architecture groupies they are, and how voracious they are in cannibalizing our field. I mean, I, they know, I'm sure, you know, 10 faculty here at the AA, you know, they know recent graduates, they read every magazine, they collage and paste it all up for their storyboards. They really follow architecture much more than we follow their industry. Um, the, the kind of basic common principle to all of this non-modular um, non fabrication is that it involves translating geometry, which in most cases is surfaces, but it can be also Euclidean geometry, translating that geometry into the path of, of a tool in some way. So the translation of a surface into the tool path is a design opportunity. I have to say, like most people, when I first started working with a computer, I started to think, and this is a little bit a victim of it, um, where do I find a machine that can print a giant shape all at once? And there was a real um, space race to find this big printer that would print big pieces of architecture. Um, at, this, at that time, all the journalists were running around saying, uh, all of the architects that are doing these blobby forms should be doing buildings that are completely unarticulated and without any features or qualities at all. So where they thought that was a way to judge the work, I don't know, but I think we were all complicit in it. But there was a kind of space race to make the biggest, smoothest, unarticulated thing with a giant printer at the biggest scale possible. Um, I have to say, I think that's the most ridiculous agenda for architecture that you could come up with. I mean, I understand how we got there, but to actually want that or theorize that as a problem doesn't make sense. So the kind of starting from the most basic principles, the, you know, what makes architecture different than sculpture is not just that we make things out of large numbers of components, but it's also that we celebrate the connection and articulation of those components one to another, and we look for ways to, um, to basically structure the relationship of hierarchies of components one to another. And it doesn't, that's not a shackle that that keeps us from doing things, it's actually what lets us express ourselves. That's why a building expresses itself differently than a sculpture, because even a large sculpture, like Anish Kapoor's sculpture in Chicago, it has panels, it has internal structure, it hits the ground, it has to do all the things architecture does, but because it's sculpture, its relationship to ground, its relationship of mass to panel, and its relationship of sculpture and interior to exterior, is totally different than it is for architecture. So for architecture to want to make a big, smooth, reflective, shiny shape with no uh, articulation of structure or interior is to make it not architecture. You know, I think those issues of component to whole articulation and structure, panel, aperture, all those things are what makes architecture architecture. So um, both theoretically and practically. So anyway, this is translating a three-dimensional surface into two-dimensional paths. It's a water jet cut piece of steel that gets welded up together to make a shell. And this was a kind of two-year research project called Embryological House we did, I don't know, five or seven years ago. Um, the, to do this in 3D, you translate the surface geometry into the movement of a tool in three-dimensional space. And mostly that involves subtraction of materials. There are some cases where it involves the addition of materials. Um, I actually, you know, have, you know, bought this machine a few years ago to have in my office. Not really so we could make things. I mean, I, I don't like to have to fabricate this stuff myself, but more so we could test the principles of the translation of the shape into the tool path right in the office. Um, so this is just showing you how that works. It's not an auto, it can be an automatic process, but it shouldn't be. So you take a surface, you translate that into a series of contour geometries first, just to excavate material. And then finally you translate it into a series of paths that follow the surface. And when you do that, it lets you draw those paths. You don't actually have to just put this in some program and have it give you a result. 
you can actually design the texture and pattern and articulation of that tool as it moves across the surface. And like the color issue, the integration of panel shape and panel texture highlights the curvature more. So these are, you know, that three-dimensional shape all derives from these two-dimensional panels. So every one of these panels is cast or vacuformed against one of these molds and then assembled up to make the coherent shape. Anyway, so that's the way these car prototyping companies work. This is an interior we did in Sweden where you can see the wall gets broken up into panels. Panels get articulated as a surface. We integrated all the shelving brackets and hardware into that surface so that it was all kind of integrated um, in the expression of the surface. And, you know, for this, we actually just emailed, we found the requirements their router needed, and we emailed the code to them uh, to produce the wall system. And this was, you know, you can do this anywhere there's a car industry. So since this was in Sweden, I called Saab and Volvo and started to ask them where they built their car prototypes, and lo and behold, there was one boutique practice that made all the prototypes for the two car companies. So. And this, uh, uh, say, a car prototype of a, of a Volvo was at this time uh, in pounds and meters, something like uh, maybe 150 pounds a square foot, something like that. So gives you a sense of the cost. It's, it's, it's a high-end boutique interior, but the price of... CNC manufacturing a car that gets painted in automobile paint with an upholstered leather interior on a metal frame with wheels. No engine or anything. But that was the same price as hiring Swedish contractors to use metal studs, plaster, paint, and minimal metal detailing. So it was incredible to me that these two industries were side by side, but the level of precision and expression was so totally different. So these kind of sloped, battered walls were all built by the Swedish contractors. They actually cost exactly the same amount of money per square meter as shaping this wall system. So, I mean, that kind of lateral exploitation is, um, you know, is something that architects can really look at. Just more examples of that kind of interior scale opportunity. And then this is a, an interior we did in LA of vacu where we milled the molds and then vacuum-formed the wall panels against it. And then these are made by surfboard manufacturers where we actually cut the foam molds and then these people that lay up surfboards lay chopped fiberglass in it for kind of sealing elements. So anyway, this kind of lateralism isn't just about fabrication and construction, it's also just about design culture and design sensibility. So I pulled together a set of theoretical principles that would tie us together with other design fields. And I think that these, these issues, mostly because I'm thinking about them from my own particular lens, have to do mostly with uh, thinking through the computer as a medium. So for me, working with digital tools um, isn't just a question of having the tool enable an architectural vision, like say, um, most people understand Frank Gehry's work, let's say, and Frank Gehry presents his work as being enabled by the computer. So he's a designer that wants to express himself and the computer enables that expression. If you spend any time with Frank Gehry or listen to his lecture, what he does is tell you about things he discovered with the computer that allowed him to express himself in new ways. So to me, that means that these digital tools aren't just neutral things, but in fact, they're expressing themselves at the same time that we're using them. So systematically, I've tried to go through and, and look at some of the characteristics of this medium. The most banal thing is that for the first time we're all using calculus to dimension our buildings and to think about shape, which just simply means that 
if you're not using a system based on differentials, if you're just using a kind of simple algebraic system, whole numbers have a greater value than fractional numbers. So you look at, and this Mario Carpo has a very beautiful book on this, um, where he, he argues that digital architecture started in the 1500s when Palladio started to use the decimal point instead of fractions. So in classical architecture, or in kind of pre, um, pre-Renaissance architecture, you always, and in Renaissance architecture, you always measured components by fractions of holes. So there would be a debate about whether the right proportion in architecture was one to seven of the nose to your face, or whether it was one to nine of your head to your body. There was a very heated um, argument about the proportional systems because you were using whole numbers. So you would dimension your building based on sevenths or ninths. Or if you wanted to dimension, let's say, the size of a window panel, you would say that there are, um, that the whole wall is broken up into uh, eight bays, of which five are equal. So you would have a five-eighths ratio of major openings, of which you would then have a one-third ratio within each window bay. So you would dimension those things always with the part to the whole. So the part was always a fractional, dimensional relationship to some larger structure. Okay, when the decimal <coughs> point came in, that started to erode the sanctity of the whole number problem. So you could suddenly say that that window mullion is 0 .0125 of the whole. You're still dimensioning it relative to the whole. You're still dimensioning it relative to whole numbers but the kind of fractional part to whole logic disappeared. Okay, 300 years ago when calculus was invented by Leibniz and Newton, the whole number disappeared as a problem. So instead of dimensioning things based on, um, say, decimal point fractions or you know, fractional subdivisions of a number, you suddenly looked at dimensions relative to other dimensions in space. So the infinitesimal eliminated the zero is a kind of base of dimension. And suddenly you were looking at series of things that were related part to whole, but part to whole in a sequential series. So now I hope this isn't like too much like high school theories of calculus, but the, the basic idea is that you look at everything in relation not to a whole and not as a fraction of a whole, but you look at relations of variables that interact that produce dimensions that you can infinitely subdivide. So, and that basic premise of calculus is now on everybody's desktops. And what the computer really has done, I think, is introduced uh, the opportunities to work intuitively with calculus um, to a field that has not been able to use it in any kind of design sense. And structural engineers, you can use calculus analytically, and people have been doing it for, you know, 100 years. You can use it to some degree um, as a reverse engineering tool, like Gaudi would, to dimension um, parabolics and catenoids. But really, you couldn't design with calculus without a computer. It's just too cumbersome a dimensional system. So I think that's the fundamental premise. Um, I think there's all kinds of other premises, like the velocity of design objects that run through our lives, the amount of des sheer design we need to do. It brings up other problems, but mostly I think it's calculus. So in terms of thinking through the problem of calculus in architecture, which is a discipline that, that expresses part to whole, it expresses interior and mass and monolith in a particular way. Um, these are some of the categories that come up. So, kind of one by one. If you draw a curve, and what's funny is I'll end this lecture on a radial curve project. So, um, but in calculus, curves are not um, radii. They're not based on a distance from a point in space with an infinite number of points, that same distance. 
Instead, they're based on infinitesimally subdivided line segments. So a curve is the approximation of an infinite number of segments put next to each other in a calculus relationship of variation, meaning that um, in the, the church in, in Queens, the panels are all uniquely shaped. So every one of these elements is a different dimension and is a different orientation. But they're producing a curvature out of that segmentation. And the segmentation variation is based on their curvature. So that each one of these elements is different but they're different in a continuous series. And you know, the reason we designed it in this way was to focus your eye to the altar. So the difference in vari variegated components is what gives it direction and shape. So curves are always infinitely subdivided segments, and you produce different grades of curvature based on the segmentation and their variation. So if you get a lot of variation, you need more segmentation, let's say. So, and the same thing on the exterior. And, you know, this project is all, also, by the way, in terms of costs and things, conventional construction. It's just we had to do all the steel detailing. But once we agreed to do all the steel detailing, which turns out to be a pretty lucrative thing for architects to do anyway, because they, steel detailers make more than architects per hour, you, you can get all of the variation for free. So, the the kind of industrialization of the steel industry and building trades is something that is just there to be exploited. Some trades aren't so industrialized in architecture, but steel is definitely one. Okay, so the fact that curves are segments in a series that vary continuously, so one segment varies against another segment based on curvature, it introduces the possibility of modulating parts and holes in unison, which means that you don't start with a whole thing and then subdivide it into parts, but actually the parts and the whole communicate with each other in such a way that they're unified. Um, for this, uh, it works at the particular scale of structure. And I have to say one of the things that I you know, am critical of right now is the fixation on structural expressionism, but I think that the kind of, that a lot of these issues of part to whole modulation translate really easily into structure. I think they could translate probably more effectively into things like decoration, fenestration, uh, pattern, but for whatever reason most architects are fixated on structure right now. But so, this is a retrofit of a nearly kilometer long building in the Netherlands, in the Belmermeer, that we won the competition for maybe now three years ago, um, that we've been working through both um, tectonically and socially. Uh, we won the competition because we proposed breaking the block up into uniquely shaped neighborhoods. So there's a kind of police law in the Netherlands that you can't have more than 10 apartments um, on a single corridor, and that you can't have more than 50 apartments fed by a single elevator. So we broke this block into 10 50-unit neighborhoods, and we gave each one of these neighborhoods a particular configuration so that when you look at the facade of the building, you'll see a discrete clump or cluster of unit types, and we assumed unit types translates into demographics. So and I'll show you some of those variations. Um, we designed the whole thing in Microsoft Excel, actually. Spent like a year designing it in Excel. Um, but what it would do is it would let us tag different unit plans with renovation cost and move different neighborhoods of apartments around. So this edge matches up to that edge, and this is a section view of the whole project. But so we can bundle together these different neighborhoods and we access them through a combination of elevators and escalators. And it's the escalators that let us give the, the blocks their unique configuration. So now everybody didn't want escalators until we explained how they worked, and now everybody wants an escalator. So there are now 13 
um, escalator runs combined with 11 uh, elevators that lets us give this kind of combination of um, neighborhood types. And to support the escalators, because um, in this particular neighborhood, kind of social security is a big issue. And in an escalator, you're in outdoor space. There's no cab. There's no lobby for the, for the escalator. So you always know who's on it. They're always in, in view and in public space. You don't get these trapped, like, public spaces rooms. So we wanted to hang the escalators on the facade. And it's a, a concrete building, so we can hang them. And each escalator is supported by a series of 11-story steel trusses that get clipped right to the existing building. Um, because the escalators are diagonal and the elevators are vertical, every one of these trusses is unique in its shape. Um, what we did, we spent the last year, in a way, engineering these things so that they have a, a uniformity in the sense that every truss is built out of the same number of elements. It's built out of a little over a thousand components. Every connection of these things is rationalized in a way that, that the connections are always uniform. It's only the lengths of the members that change. And we built with um, Robert Aish from Bentley uh, a set of custom objects where every one of these trusses has a kind of package of information. And that package of information is changed based on the location of escalators along it. So where there's an escalator, it gets wider and moves out from the building. And when there's no escalator, it snaps back into the building and ties in structurally. And all 1,000 components get driven by those particular locations. But this rendering you know, really irritates me for the, its lack of proportion. So it's driven, it's pretty much driven by two sets of constraints, one of the building, one of the escalators. But wherever an escalator stops, like right here, you get an abrupt transition from this truss to that truss. And for this project, I wanted to really push a kind of tempering of the scales, where all the parts needed to produce a whole in some way, because they already were because of the existing building. So and here I have just the result in this model. We set up a set of constraints for each one of the trusses, and then have each truss look to seven neighboring trusses to the right and left and change its shape and distribute its shape based on its neighbors. So it, every one of the trusses not only looks to the 1,000 components within itself, but it looks to the other 120 trusses. And it, we run the calculation first from left to right and then from right to left. So all of the trusses blend and merge in a way that you don't get these abrupt transitions anymore. You get these kind of continuous decays. But what it does is it produces uh, a design where all of the parts have their own part logic, but they're also tied to every other part in the facade. So this facade goes through tens of millions of calculations every time you change one element in it, because that element distributes its effect along the whole system. But they're totally modular and repetitive in the sense that they're all made out of the same number of components in the same way. So it's a kind of, you know, it's a, it's a logic of serial um, non-modular production, but it's doing it at the scale of architectural structure and facade. Um, I said this is the way we designed the Alessi set which is, and it, the Alessi set was designed as we were engineering these curves. And so what we did is we came up with eight curve profiles that you see here. And we spent a lot of time with these eight curve profiles, first to make them ergonomic so that they would be curves that would fit to a hand or fit to grabbing the shell. But then we made sure that the profiles were sympathetic in such a way that if you lofted a surface from one profile to another, the surface would never fold through itself. It would never abruptly change. And that we could basically guarantee uh, logic of curvature and continuity with it. So 
once we had those eight, the family of eight curves, which were kind of informed by the housing project, we started to combine them then in rings where, for example, this one has seven combinations of those eight curves. And if you do the algebra, you'll find you get close to 50,000 possible variations out of eight different curves in these seven combinations. So we designed 50,000 coffee pot shells. Um, I have to say, they all, you know, we designed them all. Nobody's ever seen them all. Um, and that issue to me is really interesting, where you know, this was my first foray into industrial design, and I wanted to make sure that I didn't just do the toothbrush design, which is, you know, used to be you had three toothbrushes, now you go to the supermarket, there's like a whole aisle of toothbrushes. And there's no toothbrush design conference, there are no famous toothbrush designers, there's no culture of toothbrush design, it's just, you know, high velocity design change. You know, other than the fact that they're co-injection molded or whatever, there's really nothing that interesting about any of them. It's just that they need to all be different. So I didn't want to make coffee bots that were all different just to be different. I wanted to make sure that these were 50,000 Greg Lynn 2004 Alessi coffee pots. So if I wanted to do another coffee pot, I could make it different. And that they would have a coherent identity. So this problem of designing the series is something architects are really good at. It's like components in a facade. They all belong to the same system. They're all unique, but they're all unique in a continuous series. That's something, as architects, we, we own that expertise. I mean, the, my connection to the Volvo project was Volvo said, we're gonna need architects. And I said this a few years ago at the AA, but I went to Volvo and they said, if we do these tool-free designs with these bladder forms, the way we're moving, we're going to be able to make every car different. Now, nobody's going to go online and design their own car. Just people don't even have, it's not even that they don't have the time or expertise, they just don't have the interest. So they're going to go to a car dealer and there needs to be some architect sitting there who's going to say to them, what are your desires? I will design and configure your car for you like I would do your house. And so they said, well, we know you architects all know how to do this, and we know how far ahead you are than the automobile industry because you use mass-produced parts, but no two buildings are ever the same. We follow your work. Tell us how to do one-of-a-kind mass-produced cars. And I was there with Sanford and a few people, and we were just like, you know, wow. <laughs> you know, we never really thought this was something we had expertise in. So this was a way of approaching that issue of, 50,000 individuated elements that all belong to the same family. You know, in the judgment problem, I mean, at, at this conference with Peter Eisenman, he got really upset about the embryological houses and said, if you can't, his example was Colin Rowe could look at Palladian Villas and say which one was better. He said, which one of these is the best one? And I kept saying, well, they're like my kids. You know, they're all, I love them all differently. But, but they're all mine and I love them all equally. And really that's the problem. It's not running through variation and mass production to pick or to select or to breed or make the best one, but it's actually theorizing the problem and designing it in such a way that you design the variation where they're all designed and they're all connected. So for me, the kind of ecology breeding model isn't so much the thing, it's how do you design a series? which is an architectural problem. Okay, um, at a totally different scale, uh, this is a housing project in Valencia that we're now redesigning. Like Alejandro and Winnie and a bunch of us are doing this project for Vicente Guayar. And I was given a complex of housing units and studios for local artisans. And so I staggered the the typology of the block so that there were four-story uh, apartment blocks and then two double-height floors of studios that they would share. We alternated them one to another. And Vicente put me at the kind of gateway and said, I want you to do a very iconic figural thing. And so I thought, well, how do I make this as monumental as possible? I thought, well, the, the way to make it monumental is to take the variations in the apartments and connect them with the studios so that it produced a whole 
object, like make the thing as whole as possible while still keeping the undulations in the apartments. So, and this is kind of the, there's a central exhibition space in the core of it. So, the way we did that is we came up with these 24 different uh, apartment types that organize themselves around this core. And at each level, as you step up, each one of these apartments changes subtly. I mean, basically, we try to go for the maximum performance envelope we could in terms of change. And then we stack those apartment, apartment elements up and then loft in between them these double height studio spaces. So it produces a thing which has a monolithic quality, but every part and component of it is unique. So the variation and the monolithicness are connected. But again, we didn't make a shape and subdivide it. We also didn't randomly collect variations. The two things kind of work back and forth off each other hierarchically. Um, I realized a similar I won't go so much into this project, although it was a real interesting cultural project. I mean, it's probably what made me think the most about how architecture is in the public domain. But this was the first United Architects project where um, Jesse and Nanico, FOA, uh, UN Studio, all we've been talking about trying to collaborate on something for a while. And for this, we decided to put in together, along with Kevin Cannon, who was um, somebody that we'd worked, Jesse had worked with and I knew from school, who's a kind of tower specialist from KPF that set up his own office. And we decided that we needed um, someone in the cultural realm and in the pop culture realm to help us not only communicate, but actually make decisions. So we teamed up with this firm, Imaginary Forces, that's based in LA and New York. Anyway, the, sorry, I forgot to turn this thing off. Um, so the, um, the one thing that we started with before we even were briefed on the project was that we wanted to do a complex of towers that was to some degree connected and where the towers were going to be diagonally sloping. And I can show you that later on, but it, that was more because we were looking around the field. And individually, we'd all tried to do slope towers. We also knew Rem and Winnie and, you know, Philip Johnson had proposed them. Uh, any number of architects had proposed slope towers and they didn't work. And we wanted to get to, we wanted to innovate in that lineage, let's say, of the slope tower. So what we did is we, when we were briefed on the project, we went through these 15-minute briefings of everybody in the city from subways, path trains, to Larry Silverstein, the developer, the mayor, all these people. And Pataki had said you couldn't build on the footprints. So we decided that we were going to try to connect the memorial zone, which would be this kind of bundled together footprint, with the towers in such a way that the towers made a cathedral-like enclosure around the memorial. And at the end of this briefing, um, we were invited into this thing called, the, this room called the Victim's Family Room, which overlooked the site. And it was filled with memorabilia. And it was like a kind of private space where people could come and look at the, at the cleanup site. And we decided that it was an incredibly you know, moving experience. And we decided that that memorial space that was there need, would be the, one of the basis of our master plan. We then went down into the cleanup site to the, what they called the bathtub. There was a ramp there and, and it was just a functional ramp, but as they would bring human remains out, they would always line up a color guard there and it became the kind of symbolic path. And so we decided that the, the design would be to connect these towers with a sky memorial that was a destination that overlooked the footprints and to make the path down into the footprints such that you would go down, but instead of going down um, to look at the earth, that you would go down to then look up. So this sky memorial would basically connect some sky element and would anchor a space up in one of the towers where you would go up and down to kind of connect through the site. So that principle meant that we could locate public programs both 
up at the top, well, the midsection in the end of the tower complex and down in the ground. So we would anchor this thing kind of up and down. Um, and we also thought at this point, because they got four and a half billion dollars from the federal government to rebuild the site, and because the mayor and the governor were so invested, that we could write a zoning that would have five independent buildings, but that would mandate by zoning that they needed to touch to produce some new kind of destination and support space um, at the 60th floor. And we all agreed that the kind of fixation that urban planners have about the street and that public space always equals the street was not only bankrupt in general, but that when you're building a tower complex for 100,000 people, to say that all the public space for those 100,000 people needs to be on the street seemed to be missing opportunities. So, oops, shit. instead of, uh, your laptop's fine, instead of legislating fabric and saying there would be monuments, or instead of legislating a grid where every tower was a monument, we said we should legislate a three-dimensional zoning envelope such that there was some civic public component in the bulk of the building. So, and that was, had to do with the skyline too. So in terms of looking at sloped towers, what we found is that because elevators want to be vertical, I mean, I understand you can slope an elevator, but for a 110-story building, I just frankly think you can't. Um, but in most pragmatic ways, this is Zaha's, FOA's, Winnie's, and Philip Johnson's. Because of the verticality of the elevator, when you slope it, every single floor plate is unique. And this goes back to this problem of seriality and repetition and variation. That the whole wants to have slopes, but the parts want to be totally uniform and repetitive. So, to eliminate, and in New York, we were told by Larry Silverstein, unless we had 45 to 55 feet between our core and perimeter, our building would never get built. That in New York City, that was just a kind of law of development. So we went back to the Sears Tower and looked at the way the Sears Tower worked with the central elevator core and then these tubes of uh, lease space around them and at the World Trade Center, and it was mostly Kevin who came up with this, but kind of collectively we all started to gravitate towards this idea where a central vertical elevator and stair core would be vertical, but then we would break out the office space into 110 foot blocks and locate a stair core in each one, and that would let us spiral the plates around a central core. And that spiraling would be the thing that would let us get the towers to slope. So in each one of these towers is one elevator core that's vertical, but then absolutely repetitive uniform plates that spiral around it. And at the center of each one of these plates is a stair core, because the exit stairs were the one thing that you can bend vertically. So we got this kind of robust safety system with these five main cores and then all these connected diagonal stairs. It also gave us connections between these plates where you could have one 110-foot square plate or you could connect them up and start to get really big floor plates in a tower. And then finally, in terms of the public space, we put the memorial and uh, a kind of broadcast center and a conference center was the destination program, but everything else is just all health clubs, shopping, food, things like that, that would support the 100,000 people in the complex. So they could go up to this point or down to this point rather than have to go to the street all the time. So this kind of part to whole relationship, I mean, here we kind of accentuated the fragmentation more. United Architects, we've done a couple of other projects. This one we did last year for the European Central Bank competition, where, you know, I have to blame Ben, although I now love Ben's decision, but he wanted to do this giant piece of money as a kind of skyline, <laughs> is the representation of this thing on the skyline, like a big coin. So we decided to build a, you know, rather than the World Trade Center, which expresses itself as this kind of fragmented hole with these cathedral-like um, vaults in between it. For this, we, you know, we tried to make this very logo-driven uh, sphere, but it's a sphere that's built out of six independent towers. So each one of these twisting pieces is a tower, 
in between each tower are these kind of sky atriums for mechanical conditioning and some uh, kind of breakout spaces. And then this bizarre void that runs through them. So the way we organize it is there are three elevator cores. And pivoting off each elevator core is a, a uniform floor plate that just that, um, rotates. So the diagram for one of those three cores is basically this. So the way we rotate these floor plates off the core is what gives us the spherical profile. And when you put the three spiraling plates, bands of plates, and then bundle them together with this sky atrium in the middle, you get this thing which merges at points and pulls apart at points. So that's a kind of diagram model. We located all the conference rooms and um, kind of connected shared spaces in the middle because the bank wanted all that stuff off the ground and in the middle of the building anyway. So we had this kind of natural equator. Um, anyway, you can see the way those six towers connect up to produce a thing which is much more monolithic and regulated. Maybe you back to Frankfurt. Okay, so we're close. We're all it's almost it. So we'll do it in a little over an hour. Um, another kind of brand project I thought I would show, which had to deal with um, the identity of a company, was the BMW factory. We lost to Zaha. We did this with Imaginary Forces as well. And IF always does a thing they call ripomatics for their clients, where they go look at all their identity. They steal all the techniques and bundle it together into like a one minute video. And these are some of the stills from that video. But we realized at the very first instance that BMW is just about machines. They never have a person in any of their ads. They always smoke the glass so you don't see anybody driving them. It's always this, you know, aggressive machine in a landscape. So we thought we would just have a kind of look at a new kind of machine aesthetic for them. And as we met with um, some of the people at Design Works in California and talked to them about how they design, it was funny. They told us they could make any car into a BMW with like five steps. You know, the double, the double kidney grills, the, I think it's Himmelman slash, which is the rear window that gets slashed in a backwards direction. They just ran through all of the ways to make a thing look like a BMW. So, we kind of three-dimensionally modeled and then CNC manufactured uh, the program elements as BMW signature elements. You know, so double kidneys. You know, we went through, basically branded all of the interior spaces in this as BMW signature elements. And car studios are very interesting how they integrate digital technology, but they have, when you go to a car studio, they always throw a sheet over their curves, which are the kind of ship's curves they use to scrape the clay. And all car studios still use them. But they have these proprietary curves that they associate with their brand. So we really tried to hit the kind of curvature and surface features of the BMW brand with this. And actually, at the, the kind of guy running the factory was quietly and covertly telling us all along, you got the job, you got the job. It's a total BMW job, works like a machine, we love it. And the CEO came in, he says, this is just like, this is last year to me, this just looks like BMW. <laughs> and picked Zaha, because it looked like a flower. So, it just goes to show you not to be like in the service profession. It was my first attempt at really providing a service. But anyway, the, the factory, it was a, a central hall in between multiple factories. I'm sure you've seen Zaha's scheme. Of, you know, the idea is that all of the cars flow through this space and go into different kind of checking and assembly and measuring facilities as they go from assembly to paint to body and white. So, and we CNC milled this big aluminum block, weighed like 700 pounds to kind of try to, you know, hit that machine aesthetic. But anyway, it was, a, it was trying to, as a figural exercise, figure the automobile vocabulary 
in the architectural vocabulary and connect in a way with the way BMW deals with having a 300 series, a 500 series, a 700 series and on and the problems they have keeping those things both unique and of the same corporate identity. Okay, and then finally this logic of integrating information into surfaces. I mean, this was a, a mock-up we did for a Shanghai Biennale a few, Art Biennale a few years ago where we proposed a bench that had integrated upholstery elements in a surface. So it's like a landscape that had upholstered pads like an athletic shoe or something. And that, you know, has turned into this chair we're doing for Vitra where we took the legs, the back, the arms, all of the different components of the chair and integrated those into a logic of a surface. And we're th the upholstery for the top surface of it is three-dimensionally robotically knitted. Actually, almost all Vitra furniture now is, is built with a robotic knitter, kind of based on Izumiyaki's um, uh, APOC clothes, because Vitra did the first APOC show 10 years ago. But so they now three-dimensionally knit shapes rather than cut flat shapes and sew them together. So because of the opportunities of sending a digital file to a knitter, the knitter doesn't care if, as long as you don't use more yarn of a different color each time, it doesn't care what the pattern is. So we're coming up with, we're, we're kind of debating whether we're going to actually addition the chair and have like 10,000 patterns where everybody has one of a kind or whether we'll have a dozen or so. But the upholstery pattern tracks the logic of the surface, but it also is unique in its shape to some degree. It's more of a kind of market decision, how much variation. And then because we don't want to glue the upholstery to the chair, there's a wire, there's a pattern on the fabric which we can selectively take elements of and run a wire through so that you can detach the surface off and wash it. Um, without having to unglue it, basically throw your chair away. So these are the, the studies we're doing right now to look at the kind of wire diagram. But the quilting of it is kind of like your grand, grandmother's crochet. Because we found out this digital knitter is all based on crochet paths. So we need to talk to the machine. And when we looked at the programming language of the machine, we found out that it was like hook once, thread twice, hook twice, thread once. But it was as tough like your grandmother would probably be. Actually, I'd need to hire a grandmother in my office probably. <laughs> but the logic of it is you do these crochet patterns out of a continuous thread. You don't actually weave two threads through each other. So and this is just looking at kind of the density of the panels that will knit. Um, <coughs> This is the plan of the interior of that shop I showed you. But just finally, the idea of this is that it's not just about structure and surface, but it's actually about integrating decoration, window aperture, building panel, massing, getting all these things to work synthetically and to connect them up in such a way that they produce all over effects rather than having the paneling be hostile to the skin. So for this project, we produced we kind of detail emission where the control points of the surfaces emitted a pattern. And that's what produced this decoration. So that like a frog skin or something, where the surface got denser, the decoration changed. And where the surface got broader, the decoration expanded so that they were all working together. And the kind of most virtuoso thing that did that was this collaboration with Fabian Marcaccio where we built a 100-foot-long uh, painting that was three-dimensional and had an interior to it. And for this, we had to not only texture the surface as we would manufacture the building skins, but we also had to integrate Fabian's digital painting on all of the panels. And in the end, we also tracked Fabian's brush strokes is three-dimensional relief across the different panels. So it had not only pictorial color pattern information, it had panelization, it had three-dimensional relief, and then it had this kind of expressed tooling path. So and this is what we bought the mill for. Um, so each one of these panels is like two meters by three meters. And each panel has a specific shape and also a specific section of the painting 
mapped on it. So you can see here the digital painting file is a flat fillet that then gets mapped onto these, you know, uniquely shaped elements. And we would just, uh, and then finally the fenestration, where I wanted this thing to not only be transparent, to, but to also have a kind of gradient window pattern to it that would relate to the painting. So we would map, we would three-dimensionally cut a form, we would print color, um, information on a flat piece of plastic and then vacuum form the pre-painted panel onto the form and then it's a freestanding structure that just all gets seamed together with uh, twist ties because we had to demount it and move it around a couple of times. But so it's, you know, is a painting panel texture system, it produces all kinds of medium effects that are unique. It's not like a painted sculpture, it's not like a three-dimensional painting, because it does things like the texture of the three-dimensional surface along with the painting that sits underneath it produces a kind of fluctuating form that you would only get out of that kind of collaboration. So, and I don't mean collaboration between an artist and an architect, but I mean the collaboration of building skin, decoration, panelization, and massing. You know, the things have to be working together to produce these kinds of effects. Okay. Um, let me... Jump through. This is at the point in the lecture where I just show some things to friends for dinner because I need feedback. So there are two projects we're working on right now that aren't designed <laughs> that I brought along, kind of the things, latest things in the office. This is just to give you some reference. This is the I-Beam competition that we did, but um, we did it with, uh, with SOM and with Rebecca Mendez, with Skidmore in New York, David Childs and uh, Roger Duffy. And the idea was that we would make a dumb concrete frame and an exotic building skin where all the special functions of the museum would get hung on this building skin. And I'd found this, this thing, we, you know, I'm, I tend to be very rigorous with geometry. And I was finding that when we would add material thickness to geometry, the geometry would always get destroyed for some reason. And I found out there was a tool, there was a, a setting in all software that I know of that uses spline curves uh, called curve loop cutting. And some industrial designers have this term for a point where uh, a dent in a surface, when you offset a curve along that, you offset a distance that stays uniform to the normals or to the perpendiculars of the curves. Which means as you offset surfaces like that little bump, they'll start to fold through themselves and make these loops. But industrial designers don't want loops because industrial designers are, you know, it's more about shells and continuity of shell. Like you don't have a car with folded surfaces and interiors all over its skin. So automatically that software cuts these things off and patches the geometry, but you lose all that information. So if you want to do something rigorous, you're kind of losing information. So there's a whole series of projects we've done that use this folded surface logic for its architectural effects, meaning that you can have an inside here and an outside there, and what was the skin of the building can fold through itself and produce a kind of poche, new kind of poche is an interior on a building skin. So the diagram for this tower was that inside this normal box, you would have these cantilevered uh, facade elements that would fold out and cantilever off the building skin and then at one point fold in and make an auditorium. So that's the logic of these bleb folds or of these curve loops. Okay, so that's just to show you the context of how it works. Um, I'm doing, uh, my wife and I, Sylvia Laven, are doing a house for ourselves in Venice Beach. And I have to say, like most of my leisure time, is spent walking around the neighborhood looking at all the custom chopper shops and hanging out with all the people that fabricate this stuff and it's you know the thing my five-year-old daughter and three-year-old son like really like a lot more than architecture so the language and vocabulary of 
these kinds of metal objects are something we decided to try to bring into the logic of the house. And also the color, I mean, Sylvia was here last year, but she's doing a lot of work on plastics and color and mood and affect with materials. So also the kind of over the top, this one is really subtle. I mean, this is, if you want to know about choppers, this guy is named Matt Hotch, and he does far and away. He's like the Mies of choppers right now. Um, but so he's really refining these things to the point where gas tanks, seats, fenders, exhaust pipes, frames, they're all merging with each other into this kind of continuous synthesis, but also in a very, um, for chopper culture, minimalist way. I mean, you have to know that these are choppers in the end, but, you know, the, the kind of, the articulation of surfaces, the forms and shapes that he's working out, and the way that kind of pre-machined parts that are almost found, like the engines he doesn't make, get integrated with the frames and exhausts. I got interested in, I started finding out how they make these things. They're all, some of those parts are hammered by hand, like the tanks, but a lot of these parts are rolled um, as tubes in exactly the same way you roll large structural members. They're just rolled in small shops. You know, the way this, the tubes integrate with the skin also. Another Matt Hotch bike. Okay, so um, given that interest in surfaces and in rolled structure, um, this project is literally just like a month old. It's a house um, in Marina del Rey, which is just south of Venice. It's a block off the beach. And it's in a very tight site. Uh, it's just right behind this building, right there. And, you know, okay budget, but not huge budget. But you can see how it's blocked in. So we're treating this as a kind of tunnel of space where we articulate the floor and ceiling surfaces um, as a way of distinguishing the different areas of the house. So kind of programmatically, it's just a big living space that steps up as it goes back through the site within an upper floor of bedrooms. And this is kind of the section. We st step it up so we can park a car under it, and that's what gives us this um, terraced living space. And then the way that we're shaping it is primarily through the ceilings. Like if you remember those fiberglass ceilings that I said the surfboard manufacturers make, there's a section that runs down both levels of the house that'll be built in this fiberglass that will have CNC molds and then lay fiberglass in, but will illuminate it so it's a luminous ceiling, like me at Seagram's or whatever. And this is looking at a kind of end elevation of it. So, and these are just the very first kind of studies. The facades aren't really there yet. But you get a sense of the morphology of the space. And then finally, if I jump to the models, You get, you get a little bit of a view out to the beach from the top of the house. That's the ceiling, that's one of those ceiling elements that drops down. And again, this is looking from the kitchen down this terrace living space with a ceiling element here and then this one that's up in the bedroom. But so this is kind of, you know, is a study model we did last week, kind of where we're looking at it. But these elements of the floor folding up and of the ceiling folding down and when you need a room, you basically fold the ceiling down and fold the floor up, and you get these volumes. So instead of having rooms that get divided with panels, floors and ceilings fold down into these loops, and the rooms are the things that get captured in the loops. In like the bathroom, there's a courtyard up above where the bathroom kind of comes both in and out of the house, and we'll extend that bathroom out into the court. Also, sym symmetry. You know, right now these are symmetrical. They won't be, but they'll be nearly symmetrical is a thing I've been playing around with a lot. Okay, then kind of more interestingly, more like a chopper, let's say, is the house that we're doing. That's a house for a client named Jason Bloom. And this is uh, some of the research we started with when we started doing my house in the office, which was... I'll show you the party in a minute, but it, we wanted to float a bar over the site. And so we started to look at the way structure and ground worked with flotation. So obviously Farnsworth, the way the slabs 
and the columns that are expressed on the exterior of the slab float the house off the ground. But kind of more importantly, Lena Bobardi's house for herself and her husband outside of Sao Paulo, where this courtyard gets made underneath the floated ground plane of the house. And here especially where she punches a courtyard through the upper level, and that brings light down into this um, cantilevered ground space. So using the ground and the cantilever to produce a new kind of uh, domestic space. This is the site. Um, it's a pie-shaped lot, which goes from about two meters to, say, 20, almost 20 meters out here. And we're building it so that there's a double height space at the front, but then there's a, under a covered courtyard that extends under the house and gets these punched out light wells to bring light down to it. And the punched out light wells are what makes the walls. So the house doesn't have any like walls per se. It just has these folds of the surface. Um, the fillet of the columns into the slab, you know, I kind of think of the covered space similar to the, you know, Johnson Wax was the precedent I was looking at, and when I teach and when I work in the office, we always basically take the best examples of precedent we can and try to use them rather than try to learn from, rather than try to invent stuff. Um, so this is the diagram, it's kind of the structural diagram of the house. We're engineering it with Klaus Bollinger in Frankfurt, and Klaus teaches with me in Vienna, and we've been working out this kind of truss diagram for a while that we're using. But the idea is that instead of having a slab and a slab that needs a structure, it's like a Virendil truss, so that the, what are, would have been the beams fold to make the columns, and the columns and beams lap over each other as a moment frame, so that you get the equivalent of a, of a truss, like a slab, it's only 14 feet deep. And all the structural elements are continuous and they get articulated on the exterior of the building and the slabs all hang inside it. We don't need structure nearly this big, obviously, <laughs> but this is just an example to show you how you roll the structure. What we found is that um, rolling the, st the structure is a very, the structure is a minimal cost to the building anyway, but rolling it is not that expensive as long as you follow certain rules. Like if, as long as you roll it radially and as long as you don't have to build too many of the jigs to roll it. So we took what was a diagram that was just spline curves and analyzed it and broke it down into radial segments. So you can see these big radiuses. Here every radius is different. We finally tempered the geometry so that we can build every component of the structural frame out of one of five uh, radiuses. So we need to make five templates. We'll roll a bunch of this stock. There's like 500 feet of structure for each facade that's just two, an eight inch tube that just gets rolled. And we pass the structure in front of and behind itself, as you can see in this plan of these kind of proto shop drawings where it always has to move diagonally. So we'll roll the stuff and then we have to plasma cut the joints because each joint is a unique geometry. You can see how we pull all the structural components apart. This is just a model of the structural frame, but we connect from face to face of these loops to produce the volumes of the house. Again, this is just a structural model. Um, and then finally, the relationship of the PLOT to the volume in the ribbon window is such that the PLOT not only merge with the beams, but also the slab and the skin fold along with the folds in the structure. So, and, and a little bit, you know, like the kind of occupiable structural voids in Sendai. So, we loft between these two looped frames to produce these walls that pinch at a point so that there are really no divisions between bedroom, 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 and office. But 
they actually are voids that bring light down into the courtyard. You know, these are the kind of renderings of them and a quick study of the framing. But you can see that the, this, the slabs fold and those folds produce a secondary volume that makes the voids and the way the, the ground folds up to meet the structure. So you can see this a section through the landscape, how it rests on the ground. Um, but so that you get these void spaces where the ground folds up, the slabs fold across, and you produce these voids both in the house and also where the exterior brings light down in between them. That's an elevation, the opposite elevation. And the cladding, if the state of California let us, we'll use a Teflon skin so that it'll be a little bit translucent. And if the budget will let us, we'll, we found a place that can powder coat these sections in you know, kind of chopper colors that'll be exposed. So here's that folded structure. So the vocabulary right now is powder coated metal and kind of luminous Teflon. And then the, this is also the model that we took a picture of last week when I left. But so you can get a sense of, you know, these are enclosed volumes. But these uh, kind of courtyard spaces and then this covered outdoor space. Because where I live, I mean, in the house we're in now, we don't have heating or cooling. We just open windows in the summer and close windows in the winter. So we'll be able to live underneath this house, you know, pretty much almost year round, as long as we heat the ceiling a little bit and heat the floor like Neutra always does. It'll be an occupiable kind of indoor outdoor space. Okay, that's it. Thanks. Okay, we have the lights. Uh, sometime, who would like to ask a question? Do we have a microphone for someone? Um, I wonder whether I could come back to your conversation with Peter Eisenman and to <laughs> your conversation about the coffee pot. Um, see, as I understand it, in your, your reply was that um, the legitim legitimation for you making each teapot, or coffee, sorry, coffee pot different was like, say, making children. And the thing about uh, children, I suppose, is that they have, uh, once they are born, they have you know, a will of their own, and in a way they, are, they have at least some responsibility in making um, their own difference. And I mean, I'm wondering whether your answer is, um, is not slightly disingenuous or at least partly incomplete. Because I suppose when one designs a, co a coffee pot or anything else, um, the designer is keeping at least contractually the responsible for, sorry, the responsibility for the difference. And so my question to you is really what kind of conversation or what kind of criteria you might have when you are actually creating all this difference, which, okay, is beautiful and it's fun and so on while you're working in the office. Is it all to do with process or is there something somewhat at the end uh, which you foresee which drives it? Well, I think it has nothing to do with process as an ambition, let's say. I mean, the ambition isn't the process. And that's the difference between Peter's question and my answer, to be honest. I mean, it's a little bit off the topic, but it, it's not about process. 
only because I think maybe I just don't want there to be confusion about it. Um, where design is at for me now is not uh, doing, if, if we start from the coffee pot, not doing the most ergonomic, the most uh, voluptuous, the most thermally insulated coffee pot. It's taking thermal insulation, function, ergonomics, all those things together. You know, let's say making a performance envelope out of those things. Basically saying that there's the way those things interact produces possible variations which are all equally good, both aesthetically and practically in their function. But that there's not an ideal one, but that there's a, a range, let's say. Okay, now as a designer, am I going to pick the best thing in that range or Am I going to set up a system of manufacture, communication, distribution that lets that range both cohere and vary? Now, when I go outside of the world of, you know, that coffee pot and look at, say, cars, that's what every car company is doing. You know, they have more and more models of car that get built in fewer and fewer copies. And their biggest problem is how do we have a coherent identity for all our models, but make sure each model is unique. And it's, it's, that's just a, an example we'll all know, but the more you go out in the world, the more you find out that today design is about coherence and variety. And to just say we're going to make more variations and more variety without any logic of coherence is beginning to be the biggest problem for designers. Okay, when I back out of that and look at architecture, in architecture, <clears throat> it's really about, you know, how do I do, when I design the reflected ceiling plan of the room, how do I organize the lights for the fact that there's a bias to the room in one direction, but there's spatially not a bias to the room? How do I deal with the different variables in such a way that I produce a pattern or an arrangement where differentiated elements are placed in a different pattern and maybe the elements also change in terms of their shape and dimension. So to me, the world is all architecture. You know, the problem of making a building, just from the lens I see the world in, is the problem of architecture. So when I look at BMW's line of cars, I see each car as a component in a building. And I think about the relationship of the holism of that group to the individuation of the component. And I approach it as an architect. So the only reason I would do coffee pots is because it's a path for architectural, you know, expression and experimentation and thinking. But the problem of the part and the whole is really where I think the action is. Now, for whatever reason, our, you know, 2,000 year old preoccupation with parts and holes is having some effect and interest in the world in general because people are building things more like they would build buildings. You know, in terms of where the designer and the manufacturer and all that works, it's getting more like the trade of architecture than it is the trade of craft or the trade of the ideal object. So that's why Peter's, you know, Peter's question was more about process. Like, how do you make a decision and intervene in a process? A process which is, has its own authorship, and how do you judge it? Uh, for me, I never am out of the process like that. You know, the, the shape, those eight curves, they weren't coffee pots, but they were proto-coffee pots. There was never a moment where I picked. I mean, does that, is it adequate? Could I just kind of push that a bit? I mean, it, it seems to me that I didn't take Peter's question uh, to be a question about kind of process. Um, but it's really the difference between this. I mean, um, Peter would assumably traditionally think that the relationship between a part and a whole refers to a singular object. Mm -hmm. Whereas, I mean, he seems to be indicating, as it were, that what you're doing is that actually, if you ask what the singular object is, it's the series. Right. The part, in a way, is the variable. That is to say, uh, logically speaking, 
each customer ought to buy all. Yeah, well, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you don't know. This is, I mean, this is the stuff we talk about all the time. You need to have three. You know, like when somebody collects a Roxy Payne sculpture, you know, they want to know, can I buy one? It's crazy to buy one. You need at least three. I mean, in a kind of Hegelian way. You, you can't have just. Yeah, you know, I think the world is changing, Greg, and I think that a lot of what you're talking about has an immense rel relevance to the uh, products. And I value the car as, uh, I value the car as <laughs> the ultimate product. Um, it shouldn't be viewed as a car. It is a product in, in terms of scale. I see a lot there that can be transferred across structurally. You know, I, I saw a, a project recently that was published. Um, it, was, it was Gary's project that he did for a car. And I was really disappointed, perhaps because I had a certain expectation. And I felt that he wasn't given full license. I mean, do you ever sit down and think, you know, in the, in the way I really enjoy, you know, your work and, and the provocation of it, do you ever sit down and think that, you know, in this situation, it would be good to show a car to provoke these kind of students. You know the kind of discussions we have about Vienna. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you ever think you're going to have any time to just do your own thing and then... Because in a way where you're living and working and seeing the bike... I mean, we were just up in Coventry last week talking to guys who work with amazing shapes in aluminium, amazing. And you just think, they're building an aluminium car from scratch for 50,000 pounds. Well, you can pay that for, you know, a manufactured object, whereas you can go and make your own for 50,000 pounds. So, I mean, you know where you are. There's a lot of potential to do that. Do you ever think about putting the custom bike together with some of your thoughts on that? Uh, no, absolutely. And, I mean, what's also, you know, I didn't say it, but every architect of... Um, not of substance, but that has didactic qualities. I mean, there are exceptions. Norman Foster is an exception. He doesn't teach, like refuses to teach, I gather. But with a few exceptions, everybody teaches. You know, Frank Gehry's doing that car at MIT. I mean, I don't, that's not Frank Gehry's car yet. I mean, he works in a different way. He does his R&D through his teaching to a certain degree, and then he brings it into the office. I do it a little bit differently. I start something in the office and move it into the academy and see what the broader possibilities are, let's say. Um, but I think that relationship, the back and forth, you know, you're always doing that car. I mean, you know, Mies and Corb and all, you know, all these people were always doing furniture. They were always doing objects. They were always doing architecture. You know, they never really said the problem of the building is a discrete problem. Because if, if you treat the building as a discrete trade, I mean, like Norman Foster does, you basically lose connection to the broader culture. I mean, so no, I don't want to do a car to do a car, but I <coughs> would want to do a car to know what the problems are, know what, why people buy cars, what's attractive in a car, how a car performs, all those things and, you know, bring it back into an architectural intelligence. Now, so I do think everybody has to be thinking about all these problems all the time. I mean, it's why Alessi, you know, works with these architects every 25 years. It reinvigorates the field, you know, that 25 years ago, all those postmodernists that got together to do tea sets, there was like a significant thing when they all did those tea sets. You know, it's where Michael Graves and all those people, you know, became who they were. And, same thing with furniture and all that. I mean, you know, Gary quit doing those Easy Edges chairs because he was becoming known for, as a furniture designer rather than an architect. But we all think of Frank Gary as off-the-shelf materials, inventive form, you know, kind of funny, odd function. All that stuff was communicated more in his chairs than it was in his buildings. So it's also it's a powerful vehicle for an architect to stake a cultural claim in the world for their buildings. Because people don't look at buildings the way they look at chairs, unfortunately. You know, they don't, everybody's a, in an odd way an expert in architecture because they all live in it. And everybody perceives it in a state of distraction. So they don't really pay attention to it. Whereas a chair, people sit on it, they notice it, they, you know. 
They also buy it in a totally different way. Because I, you know, I work in that or across all those fields, and I just see that there's not enough going on in furniture that relates, that polarizes what's going on in in, in architecture at all. I, I, it's a disgrace to put an Eames chair now in a, you know, in a modern building, yeah. uh, and it just seems to be a bit of a cop out. What you're doing there with, with Vitra, you know, and I've seen a little bit of it before. I think it's really matured very well with that, the the kind of integration of the shell to the to the upholstery, I think that's really wonderful. Of course, you're not dealing with issues of stacking or different things like that, but actually you could if you wanted to. Yeah. And I think it, that, that's, that's an, inter an interesting sign now that Vitra will do those kind of things, because we need to break free. There's a whole, it almost needs to stop dead in its tracks, and people need to be developing things like you're developing from their own position. I'd like to return to the point that Mark made about uh, the purchase of the entire series. Um, there is one agency which is in a position to buy the entire series, and that would be something like uh, the uh, exponents of social housing. Um, now, it seems to me that the issues you're raising, if one takes them beyond the level of luxury furnishings and cars, uh, relate to a different world, potentially, which is whatever became of that uh, correspondence that was held to obtain f uh, in the early 20th century between mass production and social provision. And but, the but the coffee pot came that. from the social housing project. I mean, I literally all those curves were initially taken off that social housing project I showed the retrofit of it. But I think Brian's point is, to, is precisely to support you. I mean... No, no, I'm saying, uh, I'm agreeing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'd just like to hear that. I mean, it, it seems to me that this is not sufficiently thought through, that the world of post-Fordism in relation to labor and in relation to social provision and the agency of that provision no longer being something like the state. Um, and the problems that have ar arisen with over-standardization mm -hmm. and, and normatization of, 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 of social housing and other yeah. forms of, of social. All these things seem to me to somehow be put back into play again. No, no, I think it is. I mean, I, well, it's, it's the social housing has been in play. It just, I don't think, has been adequately solved. I mean, I really believe like this, you know, I'm given a, whatever, a fresh start, I wouldn't build a kilometer long 11 story building with 500 apartments in a single building. I wouldn't do that. But given the fact that that's the problem, you can't, well, the other five competitors, when I did that project, they just eviscerated that block. They just chopped it up into the smallest possible pieces they could chop it up into. And that made really big problems in how it worked as a building. It also made, uh, you know, it was the wrong identity for that neighborhood that had 30 of those buildings around otherwise. It was just a violent act of fragmentation. So to think through how to keep the building as a building, but how to break it up into neighborhoods and break those down into units that whole problem of big numbers of stuff that need identity, but that don't need a single identity. I mean, that's where calculus, just at the dumbest mathematical level, thinks it through really well. It's where digital you know, design has some opportunity, and it's where these kind of quasi-mass production, one-of-a-kind technologies also help a lot. So yeah, I think, you know, you can start to do very big things that have a grain that's not just modular. And, but I, I wouldn't f try to fragment everything into saying, like, you have to have 50,000 coffee pots or every house has to be a s in a subdivision one of a kind. I think you could also just do a really big building that just is subdivided in such a way that it's very rich and varied. You know, unlike what they did in the Belmer. I mean, they tried, but, but there's not much variation. Good stuff. You, 
you began by telling us about the, the uh, vast uh, and appealing, appetizing uh, te technical potential of, uh, of parts of California, uh, specifically in st beginning with the, the potential of the aeroplane and, and the car industry. Um, well, I'd like to just make a few points. When it comes to the private motorist, uh, as you said rightly, choosing uh, the color and the shape, uh, I, I would say that this is a very questionable direction and, and the term decadence comes to mind. Uh, you see, form is something which very often is imposed. And, and if uh, the little people begin to meddle with a potential form. Uh, so there are question marks whether that is a good uh, uh, that direction. The other uh, question I have is around the, the, the ethics of the situation. The, the California and much of America is to do with surplus and, and excess and, and too much. And so if we accept that, which, for example, say the independent group accepted in the 50s and 60s, uh, if we continue to accept that today, uh, c c can we go on uh, simply sort of, sort of creaming off this technical potential and assuming we can create art and architecture? As for your architecture, I, I don't know what other people think, but I thought quite a lot of it was very weak as design, as form. And I would uh, bring up the example of the bank the, the bank building, and in particular, that last structure. It, it seems to me a sort of uh, a, a very weak, like sort of scrambling together two or three bicycles, uh, uh, and that kind of form. Uh, uh, and so I wonder whether this question of form, which you may not uh, approach in the manner that I do, that is to say I think form should be have a certain power uh, and, uh, 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 and well, I'll, I'll, I'll catch mm -hmm. I mean, go, When you say, Gustav, that you know, the word decadence springs to your mind, um, it quite often does <laughs> spring to your mind. <laughs> I mean, frequently when you've been here, uh, the word has sprung to your mind. So uh, it was no, just to, to mediate it. it, it for, no, but it's clear you have taste. You have a different taste than I have. I don't think we can generalize your taste into absolute rules about form and my taste into kind of decadent American consumerism. So, um, you know, it, part of what you're saying, you know, like all cliches, a lot of it is true, you know, but I mean, actually to say it's about surface and decadence and consumerism actually isn't true. I mean, what's you know, what's fabulous about those choppers is somebody makes them in their garage, you know, by hand with some access to industrial materials, and you know, that guy's like, you know, he's a Hispanic, his mom is Hispanic, his dad is Asian, it's all in the object. I mean, you can see all of that taste culture in the object. I mean, the one thing that is that I like about California, though, is it is a pop culture place. You know, compared to New York, it's when people make decisions, it's not how will it look in MoMA. It's, you know, how will it look on the big screen or how will it look in the chop shop or on the beach or whatever. And that popular, the will to populism rather than the will to rarification is a thing I've been very conscious about moving towards. You know, because honestly it's, you know, I think that is a thing that's specific to to Southern California, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's a culture of pop rather than a culture of, of high art, although there's a good art scene there too, but, you know, and that is maybe decadent, I don't know. I mean, I'm flirting with that world more now. But I, I actually think it's irresponsible for architects to just design for patrons and to say, you know, oh, the popular commercial world is, you know, bad, bad, bad. You know, if you can't make a contribution, I don't know why we wouldn't try to make a contribution to consumer culture, you know, rather than to, you know, political, social culture or high art, 
you know, I think being popular is an interesting thing to try. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, I just, I, I'm remembering, I don't know how well I remember, but I think that uh, it was Gagosian who was selling the, the uh, Warhol cans in his gallery in Los Angeles, and he refused to sell them except as a whole group, and he bought them as a whole group. I just wanted to make that comment. I think it might be you know, slightly relevant. Like I've never seen those 50,000 things. Like I have total confidence that they're all good, but I've never even bothered to look at all of them. <laughs> so it's really more, it's not so much that you have, you do need more than one, but I don't think it, it's really about having the collection as a closed set. I mean, I don't think you'd want to do that. Like with embryological houses, people always said, would you think, do you envision these things as a subdivision? And that, to me, that sounds like hell. You know, much better if they were kind of out in the world rather than all in a little box. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to close now. On um, your behalf, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much. Well, thanks indeed. for having me. It's nice to be back. <laughs>